I'm just going to talk in brief about Hedenac. Hedenac is an extremely vast area and it has got numerous sub-specialities. So I'm just going to touch upon you know, all of those and going to talk to you about the recent advances on the techniques. And uh, probably if, uh, I think I should congratulate Dr. Mura. It's extremely difficult to treat a patient with tinnitus. Anyways, let's uh, get on to the topic. Now, as I said earlier, what are the challenges in head and neck? Now, more and more people are moving out of uh, you know, head and neck, and ENT is becoming more of a subspecialty, most of the endoscopic sinus surgeries. It's because that amount of time you spend in treating a head and neck patient, you can as well treat uh, three patients with sinus and make price amount of money. And there is you know, not much of special equipments needed. And uh, also, you know, for a head and neck, you need to have a OT of a long duration. So the, the cost is going to increase and the quality of life for the patient is not going to be great. My speech, I'm going to outline this broad special spectrum. That is one of our training, the various presentations which I've seen in my practice. Next of the endocrine organ diseases, the malignant tumors the reconstructive options which has really changed the way the Edenac as a specialty is being practiced and some of the recent advances. Training, you know, I don't know about in the West, yes, you should be trained to do Edenac, but in, here, but in the developing world, everyone is a Edenac surgeon. You know, everyone does everything. And that holds good for even other subspecialties also. But I think in Edenac, you have to be trained, you know, the forthcoming slides, I'll be explaining to you some few slides where the training really helped me a lot. So until otherwise you're well trained, you won't be able to understand or assess the implications or the relevant anatomy. Like I had patients who have undergone biopsy and they had shoulder pain. That's because, you know, naturally the nerve has been affected and that's about it. Also, you know, you learn to manage the complications of the surgical thing and you get exposed to the allied subspecialties of pathology. Let me start off my thing with uh, laser surgeries. Laser surgeries is being increasingly used in uh, ENT, more so in head and neck. I'm just, you know, all my talk is going to be more of pictures of, you know, the patients we treat. So just to you know, share the carry-on points with you. Now, uh, this is uh, one of the patients whom we did. It's a huge hemangioma of the tongue. The patient was earlier on operated twice and it was referred. So we did uh, using a Nidiac laser. We did almost a total glossectomy. And uh, after that, she went on to have a reconstruction. Well, and I use more of a diode laser. I'm a big fan of a diode laser. Because one, the cost is much more cheaper than the CO2 laser. And I believe the indications for CO2 is very much limited. This is a patient on whom, you know, I'm doing a laser ablation of a neck and planus lesion. The same thing can be used even for to ablate the lymphoplakic patches. And also to treat the complications being done by others. This is a lady who was <coughs> referred. She is a Tanzanian and uh, who had a bilateral open cord palsy because of uh, thyroid surgery. Now, uh, and so she was on tracheostomy for three years and she came in, you know, I did a posterior carotomy with uh, vaporization of the arithmetic cartilage, especially the vocal cord process. And she's doing extremely well. I saw her last time and uh, you know, her voice is fine. Yes, it's not going to be a normal voice, but it's really going to help the person. Next is going to be the cardiac body tumors. The cardiopathic tumors are also being done, and uh, you should understand one thing: the cardiopathic tumors are almost always asymptomatic. This is a lady who was a 50-year-old lady, where you know I sent her for an ultrasound for her thyroid, and this was an incidental finding. And uh, yes, we went in and we operated. And the, most of the time, I do intralesional nebulization. This is another one patient where you know I had seen over three years back advised her surgery, she was not willing. And after three years, she presented her in the inter intern <coughs> was involved and we had to do a resection along with the 
drafting of the internal cardiac artery. And uh, I really you know I'm aware about the three cardiac body patients whom we operated with the grafting. The trick is that you have to do it within a short period of time the for the grafting so that it prevents the stroke formation. A word of caution. The reason why I say training is important is this. The next patient is going to be a classical example of what will happen if you are not going to take the right patient. Here is a chap who was 25 years old who referred to us, uh, not to me, but uh, to one of our colleagues in a, another reputed hospital with a lateral neck mass, slowly increasing in size, and they thought it was a lymph node because it was firm and mobile. They took the patient for surgery. The surgery, and, you know, rather than being about 30 minutes, took them about four hours and seven points of death. And after the problem, they started investigating the patient and they referred to me thinking to be a cardiac body tumor. So we analyzed and you know the location was not the region of the cardiac body, it's uh, well in the front. You can see here it's very superficial and uh, the blush shows the vascularity. It is uh, one of the rarest of the rare intramuscular angioma of the neck and uh, with a feeder from the superior thyroid artery. And this is one of the take homes which I'd like to convey to you all. Please do not take any patient without doing a basic investigation. Please, uh, you know, an ultrasound should be done before you take the patient for whatever it is. It will be by biopsy, FNC, whatever it is. The anterior scalpase lesions, they also fall under the preview of the endonic surgeon. And now I know more and more increasingly endoscopy is coming to be used. But uh, for me, when it's going to be malignancy, I always prefer an open technique rather than an uh, endoscopic approach. Yeah. This is a patient who had a you know, tumor of the sinus extending to the cribriform plate as well as erosion of the lateral orbital wall. He underwent a lateral rhinotomy, and uh, you can see the this is the lateral orbital wall and this is the cribriform plate area. And the endocrine surgery, I still remember when I was doing my undergraduation, there was a specific department known as endocrinology department and endocrine surgery health department. But now it's being done more by the general surgeons as well as by the ENT surgeons. There's nothing much in this except for, you know, two things. One, you know, if you're going to have a good training, you can do what we call it as small incision thyroids, which is going to really make a difference in your practice. So unlike the conventional one where you make from one end to the other, whatever with the size, small incisions will be able to do, that's one. And uh, the second point is almost always, and I mean almost always, almost always, you should identify the rectal nerve with your nerve. I know most of my colleagues say, oh, the nerve is going to be intact, don't worry. No. You cannot come out of a thyroid surgery without identifying the nerve. That's more of a crime, and it's definitely not acceptable. And generally, you know, thyroid tumors, they rarely metastasize. Here is a patient who had a huge metastasis, and only in those cases should we think in terms of doing radioactive ab ablation. Previously, radioactive ablation was being given to everyone with a thyroid cancer. Now there have been, you know, protocols. If a patient is going to have an incidental carcinoma, that is, you take the patient in for uh, adenoma, and you find out the patient is having a papillary carcinoma, and if it's less than one centimeter, even if it's going, there are going to be skip lesions, you need not have to do anything. The patient, for all practical purposes, is cured. But if you are taking the patient and if you are done only let's say a partial or a subtotal, then you have to go in for radioactive ablation. There are three things. Now the most commonly used one is the low dose or medium dose, where you give about 30 millicuries. And uh, you know, generally I don't prefer radioactive therapy. I had a patient where we took her in for a hemithyroidectomy for an adenoma. But the result, the final pathology report came out as papillary CA, and she was not willing for a completion thyroidectomy, but preferred radioactive iodine, saying that in the net, she found it to be much more easier. But she's paying the price for it three years down the line. 
she is still you know complaining of abdominal pain pain in the area for the tumor and she is extremely fragile this is the latest thing which i want to say you know of late uh, we have been getting few patients where they are thyroglobulin positive but you send them for an iron scan and it is negative it is not and it should not be considered as a false positive but you should send the patient for pet ct scanning until otherwise pet ct doesn't show up you cannot say that there is no recurrence or there is no residual tumor and uh, if the pet ct is going to light up and uh, the thyroglobin is also going to be very high either you can go and explore or you can go in for radiation ablation Now this is another one interesting case. This is a parathyroid adenoma. Here is a lady who had presented to orthopedic surgeons and underwent surgery thrice for pain in the neck, and they found osteoarthritic lesions. Finally, she had come to a second opinion to one of my orthopedic colleague, who you know investigated the patient and found out the parathyroid to be in the range of 3,000. So we just did a CT scan. I didn't do a system MRI scan. as you can make out from the size i really don't think so a system is scan was needed in this but even in other cases in normal cases it's always better to do it to localize where the adenoma is and you can go in for mini incision parathyroid surgeries and uh, airways airways it could either be because of stenosis or it could be because of any vascular lesion this is a patient who had been intubated for close to about 2 weeks You know, and as set up as a policy, beyond seven days we ensure there is a tracheostomy. It's more so to prevent this. And uh, you know, we can do either a balloon dilatation, but if it's a well formed, you have to go in for resection and anastomosis. And then we have uh, you know vascular tumors. Here is a patient with a subglottic uh, hemangioma. And uh, small. the congenital lesions there is nothing much except i am putting this just to show you in the next slide you know congenital lesions we have uh, you know thyroglossal swellings you now thyroglossal swellings the uh, only thing you have to be sure is that you don't remove it and it happens to be the only functioning thyroid gland for the child and uh, we have a branchial cyst huge one but the reason why i showed it wanted to talk about congenital is more because of this Here is a child who was presenting with a neck abscess. He was operated thrice. He underwent, uh, you know, IND thrice, but he'll be fine for about six months. Again, he'll be having it. He has underwent all possible investigations. They did a swab and everything. Everything was normal. Been on antibiotics. Nothing works. But every time comes out with an abscess. Any child who is going to have recurrent abscess in the neck, and you know, who is not responding to antibiotics. you should almost always think in terms of a branchial fistula okay so you know when the child was presented for fourth time investigator we found this so i did a dl scopy and found a opening in the piriform sinus we took the child we operated and it happened to be the fourth branchial arch fistula the salivary glands swelling so again there is nothing much great about it except for two things one is going to be the incision you know of late people are started putting incisions right at the back the conventional one they end up with having necrosis of the tip of the skin so you should never ever go beyond this going beyond this is going to cause necrosis of the skin that's one second thing is you always need to be careful that you identify the facial nerve and uh, without seeing the facial nerve please do not remove the gland because you won't be sure whether you are injured it or what and if you think you are injured it you have to go in and do the grafting it's like in autology where they say if there is going to be a nerve palsy you have to repair it before sunset the second thing is going to be about mucopenemic carcinoma mucopenemic and you know if you have a fnc probed mucopenemic carcinoma you have to go in do a neck dissection if not then you know you can uh, get away with a low intermediate grade but any high grade you have to do a neck dissection with post op radiation therapy and then we have about the maxillary ca it's always been a challenge especially in the developing world where the patient presents to you with the t10 and t12 lesions like the lady who I'm going to show in the next slide 
In those cases, we found out recently that we can do induction chemotherapy, wherein the size of the tumor comes down and becomes receptible. You can see here in our lady where you know, it is completely involved the entire thing. So we went in, did a completion, and now we have got you know graphs where you can even put in and we can get back the face. In those cases where you are not able to do anything, you have to go in for neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy, reduce the tumor size, and you can operate. This has also been accepted the method of treating maxillary disease. The larynx, the reason I'm putting it is it's more because gone are the days where any patient with a laryngeal CA, it was total laryngectomy. Like I visit internationally during the recent visit to Iraq, there they had a patient with a P1B lesion, they said, oh, we got a patient for total laryngectomy. So, you know, gone are the days where those things are done. Now it's a crime. The reason for that is, yes, it looks very good. We can give a cure, but this is what happens. So then the patient is left with having a permanent laryngectomy and needs to use either an electronic larynx or a TEP. And I initially thought of putting the videos, but I wasn't sure about the time limits. So now the thing is more about organ preservation laryngeal thing. Until otherwise, it's really very much needed. You cannot do a total laryngectomy. You have got supraglottic, you have got supraglycoid and all laryngectomies. Yes, you have to be sure that the patient is a good candidate, otherwise they might have aspiration. And then in all T1 and even in T2 lesions, you can uh, do radiation or you can do transoral laser microsurgery. As a, you know, the last day where my colleague Ronald was talking about, even about population you know, laryngeal surgery. There are two schools of thought. Both say they are the best. You know, Tom one says that radiation is the best. Whereas, you know, Strong and Jake and Steiner say, no, the laser microsurgery is the best. Both have their own advantages and both have their own disadvantages. The disadvantage with a laser is uh, going to be on the cost of the equipment. But as I said, I use diodes, so it's not going to matter much. Two, when you're going to operate, there can be bleeding which can obscure your views. And the experience of the surgeon is very important. If not done properly, it can lead to webbing. What is the advantage? Even if it fails, you always have radiation to fall on. And then if it fails, you can always go in for you know, the laryngectomies. But in a radiation, if it fails, you don't have any option except to go in for a laryngectomy. And this is what I said, there have been uh, now not much of data, but uh, it's very limited. Wherein they have been saying that a coagulator is a very good thing for uh, neurotic cancers. I use coagulation for all my routine EMP work, but I need to try it for cancers. Again, this was on poster presentation, and this is one of the things from on So rather than, you know, tossing the coin and find out whether to send the patient for radiation or for, you know, transoral surgery, so you can discuss options with the patients and allow them to take a call as to what they want to do as both have got the advantages and disadvantages. Now, as I said, the reconstruct surgery has really changed the way how head and neck has been practiced. Here we have a patient with a basal cell carcinoma who had an extensive lesion. Along with it, she also had a you know, suspicious thing. So we went on, we did a wide resection, set it for the frozen and the nodules were negative. And you can see the huge defect. In fact, we even removed this. And we, will, we were able to reconstruct it using advanced flat, as well as both the forehead as well as the cheek, and did a skin grafting for the defect in the forehead. You know, once it heals, the patient is going to be fine. Previously, we have, you know, we have been using the pectoralis major flap. In fact, it was known as the main <coughs> flap for Edenai. Anyone, any training, they always teach you how to do a PMMC flap, but now things have changed. It's more of the free flaps as well as the local regional flaps. Vascularized bone flap, here is a gentleman who presented to me with the Christmas, and he is a bone and good cut chewer. He was initially diagnosed by having submucous fibrosis, which he has, and there was a small ulcer. The other thing which I want to talk about now is any ulcer 
which has been present for more than a month, you should always suspect. There's no harm in uh, taking a biopsy, but there is a harm in not doing it. In the next two, three slides, I'll tell you what has happened to one of my patients. So here's a gentleman, and we did a MRI where it was showing that it was involving the periosteum, but it was not involving the bone. But since the diagnosis was spindle cell carcinoma, went on to excise it and uh, used a fibula free graft. We can use it with the skin. Let's say if a patient is going to have a cheap lesion and uh, you have to sacrifice the skin, in those cases you can use the skin. In where it's not needed, you can just you know repitalize the skin and use it to line the mucus up. Now this is one thing, one patient which I want to talk about. Initially, we used to do for tongue, we used to do radial forearm, and you know, without depithalizing, you can see so many hair follicles in the mouth, and now we all depithalize it. In particular, I want to talk about this patient. This was a 28 year old gentleman who presented with a tongue ulcer, it was not major. Seen by three dentists, biopsy is taken, and they all said it's fine, it's fine. But when he came, I found out, you know, it is not fine. They have not taken the biopsy in the right region. There was a huge neck node. We went down top right, we put a radial forearm flap and did a radical neck dissection. But in spite of all that, we lost the patient since the tumor was involving the internal carotid artery and you know, he had a bad metastasis. So please, any patient with an ulcer or in a suspicious lesion, you should always take a biopsy. The sensate flaps, uh, you know, this is another thing where here is a gentleman who was 80 year old, who had a hip lesion. I had a previous patient, but you know, I had to refer him more because of financial reason, and he underwent a radial forearm free flap. You know, it's going to be extremely difficult for the patient, and it's also cosmetically not acceptable to put a radial forearm over here. You know, here is a gentleman who had a lip. Thing. He was 80 years old and he was very, very fond of singing. So we went on, we did our resection, and here is the, you can see the lesion, the amount of uh, excision. And the thing over here you can see is the mandibular nerve. So we maintained the nerve to give him the feeling and we underwent a sensate thing, and you can see the post op thing how it looks normal. Yes, the mouth opening is slightly reduced, but not much. This is another thing, vascularized growth center for mandible, especially in the pediatric population. You know, we just can't put a free fibula because it's not going to grow in a child. We have to change it. Here is a child who had aggressive fibromatosis. Underwent, you know, surgeries three, four times, but every time it keeps recurring. So we did a very major surgery where we did a hemimandibulectomy and went on to drill the skull base and took out a rib graft the rib in a child is, you know, found to grow, and we used it to, you can see the rib here, in fact, we used two ribs, one for the mandible and one for the skull. And coming on to some of the recent advances in the field of RNA, one is going to be, as I said, the endoscopic surgeries, but I use endoscopic surgeries only for benign tumors or for CSF leaks, rather than for cancers. Two is going to be the side endoscopy, Previously, it has always been open excision and the removal of the gland, but now the cylindroscope has uh, changed it. You can see the thing in the parotid. Unfortunately, I changed my you know, the laptop so I couldn't show you the video of this. And as I was saying about the coblator, I use coblator more for sleep apnea, for adenoids, for tubuloplasties, rather than for oncological procedures. Now, gone are the days where we used to do PET CT. Now we have got a PET MRI. In fact, in India, there's only one center which has a PET MRI. It's very costly, yes, but it does help in uh, analyzing the patient. The problem with the CT is it has got, you know, if a patient is going to move, you're going to have artifacts. The MRI is very good for soft tissue, and it's the method of diagnosis for head and neck as well as for pelvic tumors. The same thing, whatever I said. And then we have transoral robotic surgeries. Well, I do not have much of experience in this, but I know it has been proved to help, and especially in the base of tongue lesions. 
and as well as in uh, you know supraglottic tumors, especially in the epiglottic regions where it helps. It helps in the faster recovery, no incisions. And then you know it's all going to be about chemotherapy. There have been a lot of advances in uh, chemo. Previously we used to give post surgical chemo RT, now it's all you know induction chemo, new adjuvant chemo RT. And there have been a lot of drugs which you know we are going to hear in the last in the next two to three days. Now the focus is more on P53 <coughs> mutations, it's, it's more on HPV, it's uh, more of you know epithelial growth factors and there have been drugs which uh, help in controlling all this and it's all you know in the trial period only one or two have been accepted and it's been followed but most of it is in the trial period. And this is what I said now there is going to be a huge study in India, it's going to be a multi-centric study about a human papillomavirus and uh, mainly about mRNA and how to help in diagnosing and also in uh, putting the patient whether they're going to be cure or they're going to be an observation. And uh, finally, you know, this is something which uh, I like to say it's going to be science fiction to science reality. I'm involved in a research wherein we are getting into phase two where, uh, you know, initially it was started for treatment of uh, cholesteatomas, where we are using genetically modified, initially used bacteria. Now we are getting, to getting into genetically modified viruses. We are going to use it to treat cholesteatomas and soon we are going to start uh, you know, the Indian chapter where I will be heading it to treat uh, you know, head and neck cancers. Thank you. like there's one way but generally the easiest method is going to be you make an incision find out the tracheal pointer the tracheal cartilage is almost always going to be there you just cannot miss it if you are not going to find the tracheal cartilage then you have to relook and that's why you know I always make an incision down mm -hmm. and wherein you elevate it see the stratum asteroid if possible find out the posterior belly of the gastric the nerve is going to be in between the tracheal cartilage and the posterior belly if not, you have to go posteriorly, find out the mastoid bone tip, and then when the ECS is going to the tracheal cartilage, the nerve invariably will be about one centimeter beneath the tracheal cartilage. And two, which always says, if beyond the tracheal cartilage you do something and you find bleeding, stop. The nerve is very, 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 very close by. And always, almost always, just like in cochlear implants where you know you don't use monopolar. Once you see bleeding, please stop using monopolar. It's a strict no-no. And uh, I have a second uh, question. Uh, to prevent the recurrence, uh, which approach do you uh, prefer to operate thyroid uh, kits? Uh, which operation? Uh, I prefer uh, Sistrong operation technique and uh, what's your technique? Well, Sistrong is the only accepted thing. There is no other way of preventing, you know, recurrence. You have to remove the IR bone you, and also the base of tongue from hands attached. Without that, you are going to get recurrence. I have operated on a child where, you know, they have done it twice, but they have not removed the IR bone nor the base of tongue. You know, you just cannot, even if you cannot follow the track, I always remove the tip of the base of the tongue, mm -hmm. just cover the IR bone to prevent the recurrence. And also coming to your nerve thing, in case, you know, I had, I had to do it on two patients, you find it's a carcinoma of the parotid and you you're not able to find the anatomy. All you have to do is come down from down to up. That is, try to find out one of the branches of the facial nerve. The most thing is going to be mandibular. If you can't find the mandibular, find the cervical, trace it back. You will find the nerve. Thank you. So. <coughs> 